The Cold War was a period of immense geopolitical tension between the Soviet Union and the United States, following the fall of Germany at the end of World War II. The period is characterized by nuclear and chemical weapons threats, counterintelligence, the space race, and the assassinations of many prolific characters in various countries. December 25th of 1991 is considered as the official collapse of the Soviet Union when Mikhail Gorbachev resigned, giving office to Boris Yeltsin as president of Russia. Although the colors of the flag had changed, the majority of upper-level agents and politicians remained, along with skeletons of the systems in place. Many of these agents and politicians went on to have very promising careers. One even becoming president of the Russian Federation. Multitudes of people from all ranks of office and military defected to the United States, further feeding this culture of espionage and government secrecy. With the defectors came intelligence. One man by the name of Vasily Mitrokin came to America with six trunks of notes, archives, and copies of top-secret Russian documents. These files, later known as the Mitrokin Archive, included hundreds of reports detailing the KGB's involvement in decades of foreign intelligence operations, some even taking place within the United States. These operations included, but were not limited to, the political destabilization of Turkey wiretapping Henry Kissinger, the neutralization of political dissidents within Russia, and the use of information warfare in business and politics. The notes were created by Mitrokin throughout his time as an archivist for the KGB, where he made copies of files that were being transferred and stashed the copies away, forming a collection that he later brought with him to the United States in 1992. The British Embassy gave sanctuary to Mitrokin and his family in exchange for the archives that he had been accumulating over many years employed by the KGB. After analyzing the contents of the documents, the FBI had described them as the most complete and extensive intelligence ever received from any source, and were almost immediately able to verify legitimacy due to the accuracy and detail of the files as well as Mitrokin's certified past and legal papers. Before his passing in 2004, Mitrokin expressed that his desire by handing over the files was to unveil how thin the threat of peace actually was during the Cold War. And in order to better understand the KGB, it's important to understand what came before. With the Soviet Union controlled by Joseph Stalin, the secret police, then known as the NKVD, would become the most efficient tool for one of the most brutal and deadly regimes in world history. Under this guise of state security, these secret police forces were able to rapidly extend their reach into every facet of Soviet life, with an objective of absolute control. This period in Russian history is well known for massive amounts of murder and human rights atrocities, with death count estimates of over 20 million under just Stalin himself. Stalin's Communist Party implemented forced labor camps, also known as gulags, farming collectivization that caused numerous famines, direct judicial executions, and also countless instances where the secret police would just go around slaughtering whole cities and groups of political prisoners, especially throughout the year of 1937, known as the Great Terror. In 1943, during Nazi Germany's occupation of Ukraine, a mass grave was discovered in the town of Vinitsia, where the secret police of Russia carried out the execution 
of an estimated 10,000 Ukrainians. It was reported that the majority of the victims found at this site were dispatched via two 22 caliber rounds to the back of the head. Two were necessary because a 22 is an incredibly ineffective round. By 1948, Mitrokin had begun working as a foreign intelligence officer for the Russian State Security Department, known as the MGB, which would combine with the former NKVD to establish the KGB at about the same time of Stalin's death in 1953. Because of this, Mitrokin's notes would also contain vital details regarding intelligence operations from multiple decades. With Stalin's death, this horrific period of suffering for the Soviet people had more or less come to an end, and a new era of espionage and political tension was established. The KGB would begin to play roles in almost every domestic conflict, as well as many international affairs. The notes being produced by Mitrokin would be one of the most crucial for understanding the operations of the Russian secret police and intelligence agencies. The first chief directorate was a branch of the KGB tasked primarily with foreign intelligence operations, and the subsection responsible for disinformation campaigns was known as Service A. The majority of these campaigns were directed at the United States, also known as the main adversary. In his archives, Mitrokin detailed how conspiracy theories were spread about the JFK assassination, Martin Luther King, the CIA, and many other aspects of American society. Many of these theories were effective enough to still linger around to this day, although some other campaigns could be described as shenanigans at best. In one operation, they had sent anonymous letters to media outlets pretending to be Klan members, giving inside information accusing J. Edgar Hoover of promoting homosexuals in the FBI in exchange for sexual favors. To this very day, the conspiracy theory still exists. Hollywood actually made it into a movie back in 2011 with Leonardo DiCaprio. An extremely large amount of the spies in Europe and America were native to their respective countries. They did not come from Russia. Rather, the communist propaganda and ideologies had been so well dispersed that the minds of those in power had been corrupted. Hyperpolarized and brainwashed, these officials would relay intel back to the KGB through intermediary Soviet agents. In his archive, Mitrokin explained how the Soviet deputy prime minister and legal architect behind the great terror, Andrei Vyshinsky, had conveyed immense satisfaction with their disinformation campaigns regarding firearm limitations within the United States after he had read a speech from Truman on the subject. Vyshinsky stated, I could hardly sleep all night. Last night, having read that speech, I could not sleep because I kept laughing. Truman was extremely against firearms and the Second Amendment entirely. Truman had once described it as stupid and one of the worst amendments of the Constitution. Truman most likely wasn't an actual agent, but he definitely fell for the anti-gun propaganda. And because I can't play favorites, Mitrokin also adds that the NKVD also was successful in infiltrating all the most sensitive sections of the Roosevelt administration. A large portion of the six trunks of intel from Mitrokin alleges that almost all of the United States government is corrupted or being surveilled, or some combination. But not just the US. British intelligence gave the French DST a list of around 300 names of Soviet spies operating in just the French government alone. Another excerpt describes how Truman's advisors would withhold information from him because they couldn't trust him to not tell the CIA director about it slightly unrelated but still very interesting. Later in Mitrokin's life, he would co-author multiple books about the subjects discussed in the archives. In the first, he details work in the disinformation sector, explaining that about 50% of the agents produced quality work, and the other 50% were pretty much entirely incompetent, also adding that many didn't want to work in this sector 
because you were unable to travel as much and there was not enough upward mobility. So it certainly makes sense that some of the projects sound like Mad Libs. Much of the real quality intelligence work that arose from the KGB was fabricated by the field agents who they would call illegal agents. These were operatives that did the real Hollywood level spy work. The KGB would claim that these agents were essentially rogue and of course were not protected by diplomatic immunity. One agent by the codename Max and his group of assassins were able to plant over 150 explosives on cargo vessels that were smuggling vital wartime resources to Germany from Buenos Aires, Argentina from 1942 to 1944. I find this part fascinating because not too long ago, a documentary series was released with Tim Kennedy where he presents near damning evidence that Adolf Hitler did not actually die at the end of the war and instead fled to Argentina which was a safe haven for not only German citizens, but also an estimated 250,000 Nazi soldiers. With tons of German military infrastructure set up for not only living comfortably, but also potentially planning attacks. U.S. foreign intelligence also verified this secret partnership between Argentina and Germany. The agents also verified the route used by these transport ships in order to avoid detection first to Spain by water, then through France by ground and into Germany, which also happens to be the route that Hitler is suspected of fleeing through. Some declassified documents from intelligence agencies also show that the body was unable to be confirmed as Adolf Hitler, and a lot of effort was put into trying to track him down after the war. Or maybe that's just disinformation. The operations from the Soviet intelligence agencies were certainly extensive, and the Mitrokin archive is by far one of the best resources for information on the internal operations of the KGB and NKVD. Only so much could be put into a video, so I'll be sure to put the book in the description if you want to check it out. It has absolutely insane details and provides an incredible amount of insight. For example, when describing the multiple assassination attempts of Trotsky, and how he let out a blood-curdling scream as he had his skull bashed in with an ice pick. Definitely check it out if you're into that sort of thing. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to subscribe. Let me know if I missed anything in the comments, and I hope to see you in the next one.